beginning in verse 1. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. And then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. And the next day a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And so Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fear for all of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David for he went out and came in before them. Psychologists tell us that most of us at one time or another in our lives have dealt with a condition known as confirmation bias. It's the idea that perception is reality, but maybe more accurately, your perception is your reality, that we tend to look at the world from our perspective and receive confirmations of what we already believe to be true. For example, if you ever had the experience of purchasing a new or different vehicle, or in my case, borrowing vehicles from numerous deacons over the last few months, and you're on the road and you look around and you start to notice that many people drive the same car as you, and you never noticed it before. Or perhaps you pick out some new clothes and a new outfit and you notice, hey, other people actually wear those things too. Or you start going to new events and new places and you find out that there are people in similar lines of life who are doing the same thing that you do. I heard the story of Joe DiMaggio, the great Yankees baseball player, taking his son to a game after he had retired. Longest hitting streak in Major League Baseball, one of the famous players in the history of Major League Baseball, walked into the stadium and everybody, when they recognized him and saw him, they began to stand and cheer and applaud his presence in the stadium. His boy looked around and looked up at him. He said, look, Daddy, all these people are here to cheer for me. His dad kind of patted him on the head and said, yes, they are, son. It gets this way for good and, and, for, and for worse as well. Good and for evil can be used in, in both ways. I don't know if, if, you, if you get on social media a whole lot. If you're not, you're probably not missing out on a ton. But if you do, what happens is the, the algorithms on Facebook and Twitter and other places are set to reinforce what you already believe. They're set to confirm the biases that you already have in your life by showing you the same posts from other friends. I've got an interesting perspective. A lot of my friends from college tend to be on the liberal side of the perspective. And what's funny is I will see posts from several of you saying this is the greatest time in the history of the country. And then I will see posts from the same church members, different ones of you, but the same church who will say this is the worst time in the history of our country. And they will be right on top of one another. I don't believe either is true. I don't believe it's the best time, nor do I believe it's the worst time. I think there's somewhere in between. But we are designed to confirm our own biases. And here's what I see happen in church life more than anything else. What you will do is you tend to believe what you want to believe. And it doesn't matter if nine things are going right in church life. That one thing that's going wrong is going to eat away at you if you let it. Perception is reality, but your perception is your reality. And if you don't have godly friends 
to speak into your life, or worse than that, if you ignore godly counsel and determine to go your own way, you'll end up in the same predicament as the king of Israel. Here is Saul, the man once used of God to conquer the enemy, to establish the kingdom, the man who once anointed by Samuel had the calling of God on his life, now beginning to decline rather quickly. He had disobeyed the Lord. He had fallen away from his command. And because of cultural and spiritual blind spots, God was working right in front of Saul, and yet Saul couldn't see it. And beforehand, he had called David to come into his house after David had slayed the giant, Goliath, the giant Goliath and had come in to conquer the kingdoms on behalf of Israel. Saul had said, bring David into my house. Don't let him go home to Jesse. I want him here with me. That's how popular he is. But as time wore on, and people began to praise the name of David more than the name of Saul, and as Saul continued to listen to voices that were not of the Lord, he stopped listening to the voice of the Lord and started listening to voices inside his head. His attitude towards David quickly began to change. And really what it came down to was a matter of the heart. And do you know something? It is impossible for you to make godly decisions for yourself, for your family, and for your church if your heart is not in the right place spiritually. Somewhere along the line, Saul stops obeying the voice of the Lord, starts listening to the voices inside his head, and the Bible tells us that he's actually being influenced by an evil spirit. Because when your heart is hardened, you're vulnerable, you're susceptible. When your heart is jaded, a lot of times you'll do things that you wouldn't normally do. And the Bible specifically tells us that Saul becomes jealous. Now, here's the thing about jealousy. Just about everybody that's jealous in this room or in this world doesn't know they're jealous or doesn't admit they're jealous. It's like saying, get rid of the idols in your life. Well, you think of the idols as a wooden statue in your room. It's what you can't see that blinds you. Saul is no different. And jealousy, as he begins to look at David as the one who is taking care of the kingdom because Saul himself has abandoned the authority that God gave him, jealousy begins to turn his heart into a mess. It chews him up. It spits him out. And if you'll ever notice in the Bible, all of these characteristics go together. Jealousy, envy, warfare, strife, they all come from the same place. This is Cain outside the Garden of Eden when he looks around, he sees that the Lord has accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he hasn't accepted his own. And Cain, rather than saying, thank you for accepting my brother's sacrifice, let me be more like my brother and love the Lord, he becomes jealous, he becomes envious, and at the end of the day, he murders his brother who did what was right. Here's Saul, listening to these voices, coming back to the kingdom, and he hears them talking about him in, his back, in the background. Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his tens of thousands. And he begins to think to himself, what if David's goal is to take over this kingdom? What if he's trying to usurp me? What if he's trying to declare mutiny on the kingdom that I believe to be mine? And he becomes so jealous and so upset at that that when he comes back, the one who was playing the music in order to comfort him, he throws a spear at him, attempting to pin him to the wall. That is not just a disciplinary tactic, hoping that David will get better. He is hoping to eliminate David from the face of the earth. Here is Saul, unable to see the blessing that God has provided for him in David, with David, and he's got murder on his mind. He's got murder in his heart. You know what jealousy does? It takes your eyes away from the Lord and onto the circumstances of people. It takes your eyes away from the throne and to the footstool. And whenever you're more focused on what God has done for others than what he's done for you, your heart quickly gets in trouble. And so here's a question you may be asking yourself, why does this person get everything? Why do they have it together? I work harder than them, I do more than them, and maybe in the back of your mind you don't say this out loud, but you think I deserve more than them. The better question is, why do they get everything? The better question is, why do any of us get anything? 
Because when you start looking at life from the perspective of what I deserve over another person, rather than from the perspective that everything we have is a grace, is the gift of the grace of God, we're in trouble. God always shifts that argument around with, I'm God and you're not. And so how do you guard your heart against jealousy? And you say, this sermon is for somebody else, it's not for me, I'm not jealous. If you're saying that to yourself right now, this sermon probably is for you. Because very often by the time we realize we're jealous, it's too late. It's funny what it'll do. I've seen kids turn against their parents, but I've also seen parents turn against their kids. I've seen faithful church members who once came through these doors, every time it was open, become upset or jealous or envious of someone else in the church. How come they got to do this and I didn't? And they're out the door. And the last years of their life are wasted from what God could have done with them. It'll chew you up, it'll spit you out, it will destroy your heart. And so what do we have to do? We have to do what Jonathan does here. We have to move from selfishness to selflessness in the same manner of our Lord who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Somebody has said unselfishness is the magnet of the heart. It draws people to you where selfishness will always drive them and push them away. I want you to see Saul's response contrasted with David's response. Jonathan here understands the true nature of friendship. He will echo what Jesus will later say, greater love hath no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He's more concerned about the welfare of another than he is for himself. Notice what Jonathan does here after he hears the proclamation of Saul. He's been there when Goliath has been slayed. Maybe Jonathan didn't act on that, but he saw what David did and it gave him courage. And the first thing that Jonathan does after Saul speaks, look at verses 1 and 2. He makes a covenant with David. He loves him as his own soul. And here's what Jonathan, the son, the prince, supposedly the heir to the kingdom after Saul, look what he does. He takes off his robe. He gives it to David. He gives his armor and his, and the Bible says, even his sword and his bow and his belt. They want us to notice that. Now, previously, Saul had tried to give David his armor, and David had said it wouldn't fit. But here, Jonathan gives David his armor, and Jonathan takes it. Jonathan, rather than being jealous and upset at the recognition and the anointing that God gives David, does everything he can to prop up his friend. And indeed, for the rest of his life, Jonathan will be a better friend than David ever had, always looking out for him. He's more concerned about his friend than he is for himself. And he takes a page out of Abraham's playbook here, because when the people at the Tower of Babel were attempting to build that tower and make their name great, it crashed. And in the next chapter, God said to Abraham, Then Abram, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And so Abraham's able to say to his nephew Lot, You pick the land, because he knows that God is in control. And David is okay. Jonathan is okay with his friend David receiving the accolades as long as God receives the glory. He's not jealous. He's not envious. He's not saying, God, why him and why not me? He's simply supportive of God's purposes and anointing. Do you know what God can do with a group of people who aren't worried about who gets the credit as long as he gets the glory? Everything. Everything. But friends, when you walk into this house and you spend your life saying, why do they get to sing and why do I not? Why does this person get to do more things than I do? Why do they get to teach and I don't? Why does their life seem to be working out better? I know how they live outside. When you're constantly putting people between you and the Lord, your heart gets caught in between. And so he tells us we have to move away from that. We have to declare and love the good of others rather than ourselves. And then I want you to notice what Jonathan does here. Away from Saul, he moves from revenge 
to repentance. And this is the contrast of really David's response instead of Saul's response. When Saul declares that he will wipe out even the people within his house, Saul shows mercy to his enemies and spite to his friends. He's got it backwards. David will say when he commits a great sin a few years later, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Saul won't wait for Samuel to show up. He won't wait for things to be made right. But David waits on the Lord to be king. He won't touch his anointed. And really what it comes down to in your circumstances of life, whoever you're with, whoever you think's got it better than you do, whoever you're envious of, it really comes down to do you really believe that God is in control? I'm not talking about whether or not he's in control of the universe. Most of us believe that. I'm talking about whether or not he's in control of your life. That he has a desire to bless you. That he will not withhold any good gifts from his children. It's real easy to weep with those who weep. We can do that. To mourn with those who mourn. But do you rejoice with those who rejoice? Do you celebrate with the person who got the position over you? That's where it gets tough. And pastors aren't exempt from this. I remember Raymond Ward, before he passed away, he told me a lot of things that I do not remember, a lot of jokes that I will not share again. But one thing he told me in a moment of seriousness and levity for him, he said, at some point in his ministry, 60 years worth, he said, I resolved to never be jealous of my fellow pastors. Do you know what a lot of pastors do when God is working at another church down the street? <laughs> they don't celebrate with the other church. They either criticize what's wrong with that church or they wish he would celebrate in their own church. I found that in my own spirit. And I began to determine whatever God is doing in another church, I'm going to celebrate that just as much as I do in my own church. And so when I see God working in different churches, I do my best to celebrate with that pastor. Even if I don't agree with everything, I celebrate what the Lord is doing. I hear that God is working in other parts of this county. I hear he's working down in Central, Pellville, and Union. Word on the street is he's even working in Lewisport. Praise God. And we thank the Lord for that. But whenever we start looking and saying, God, why are you working this way in my life and not celebrating what God is doing right now? Our perspective will be forever altered. And I want you to notice what's happening to David finally in the midst of all of these circumstances that are taking this place. You know what we want to do? We want to tell the story of David and Goliath because it's a fun story. David goes out and says, I'm going to slay the enemy. I'm going to declare that there's a God in Israel this day, and all the earth will see it, and they do. But what we don't often dwell on is for the next 15 years of his life, before he is officially appointed as king over Israel, he spends his life on the run. And not because he has to. He's got opportunities to take Saul out at every step along the way, and yet he says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And I want you to notice what David does in the middle of all that. It's easy to think, I'm going to go out and slay Goliath, but what happens when it's not Goliath who's opposing you, but the very king that you're supposed to serve? What happens when it's not the enemy that's out there, but when a trusted friend who is over you or a boss who lords it on you, how do you respond in that? Because everybody that you disagree with, you can't take a slingshot and a stone and try to knock them out in the head. What do you do? Notice what David does. He believes that God is in control. He waits on the Lord. They say that as the Titanic sank in April of 1912 into the chilly waters, that the band got together, the ship capsized, as they were well short of lifeboats to where of the 2,200 passengers on board, more than 1,500 would perish that night. The band began to play. As the lights went out and the ship sank, nearer my God to thee. Not because every person on board that ship believed the song, but because they knew that at the end of their life, there was a point where music honoring God could comfort. And here's David being sent after by Goliath, now being 
almost murdered by Saul. And he continues to play. He continues to sing. He continues to make melody in his heart in the Lord. That's what Paul and Silas do in Philippi. They've got him in jail. They say, man, you can stop our progress, but you can't take our joy. And he begins to encourage himself in the Lord. In fact, this is what he writes in the Psalms. And incidentally, if you're reading the Psalms at this point, read your sublines, read your headlines, because a lot of times he's re- he is writing those Psalms in response to something that's occurring in his life. A lot of times it's when Saul is chasing after him. But in one of the Psalms, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises will continually flow from my mouth. Can you bless God when things aren't perfect in your church? Can you bless God when someone else gets the credit for something that you felt you did? Can you rejoice with those who rejoice? Because I'm telling you, it will make all the difference for the state of your heart to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, we say, rejoice. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, berryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.